On March the 16th, 1926, Robert Goddard performs the first flight test of a liquid-fueled rocket in Auburn, Massachusetts. This gasoline and liquid oxygen-fueled rocket burned for about 20 seconds before lifting off from the ground and subsequently rising to a height of 41 feet, reaching a top speed of 60 miles per hour. Unfortunately, the camera Esther Goddard was using to film the first flight ran out of film before the rocket managed to leave the ground, so there is no video of the event as there would have been. Goddard recorded the following about this launch in his diary. March 16th. Went to Auburn with Sachs and AM. Esther and Mr. Root came out at about 1 p.m. Tried rocket at 2.30. It rose 41 feet and went 184 feet in 2.5 seconds after the lower half of the nozzle burned off. Brought materials to lab. Even though the release was pulled, the rocket did not rise at first, but the flame came out and there was a steady roar. After a number of seconds, it rose slowly until it cleared the frame. And then, at express train speed, curving over to the left and striking the ice and snow, still going at a rapid rate. Goddard had been performing experiments on liquid-fueled rockets since 1921. Before this, he experimented with using a stream of rapid-fire solid charges, but this proved impractical, so he switched to using liquid fuel, something he'd first thought about in a paper he wrote on February 2, 1909, but had not pursued at the time. He was finally successful in creating an engine for a liquid-fueled rocket in 1923 and steadily improved on the design, testing it in static racks in a lab. His initially liquid-fueled rocket design had the combustion chamber at the top of the rocket with the fuel tank in the back heavily heat-shielded. He did it this way as he thought it would improve stability over having the thrust in the rear. After this test flight, he realized this design didn't actually make the rocket more stable and so he modified it to put the combustion chamber in the rear of the rocket, which is more convenient. Five years later, his rockets now looked very much as rockets do today and he began focusing on making them more stable using a gyroscopic guide. Guidance system. He was soon successful in creating a guidance system, and on March 28, 1935, he launched his A-5 rocket to an altitude of 4,800 feet while achieving supersonic speeds on that flight. Goddard's dreams of someday building a device that could launch a man all the way to the moon and beyond began back in 1899 while pruning a cherry tree. This is his account of the event. On the afternoon of October the 19th, 1899, I climbed a tall cherry tree and, armed with a saw, which I still have, and a hatchet, started to trim the dead limbs from the cherry tree. It was one of the quiet, colorful afternoons of sheer beauty which we have in October in New England, and as I looked towards the fields at the east, I imagined how wonderful it would be to make some device which had even the possibility of ascending to Mars, and how it would look on a small scale if sent up from the meadow at my feet. I was a different boy when I descended the tree from when I ascended, for my existence at last seemed very purposive. He later celebrated a personal holiday every October the 19th as his anniversary day. His dream of using a rocket to reach the moon and beyond actually got him ridiculed in the media. This primarily stemmed from a published report in 1920 where he outlined an experiment to shoot a rocket to the moon and then have the rocket loaded with flash powder that would ignite when it hit the moon. This would allow people on Earth with powerful enough telescopes to see the flash and thus be able to confirm the rocket made it to the moon. On January the 13th, 1920, the day after his report was published, the New York Times had the following to say about it in an editorial. After the rocket quits our air and really starts on its longer journey, it will neither be accelerated nor maintained by the explosion of the charges it then might have left. To claim that it would be is to deny a fundamental law of dynamics, and only Dr. Einstein and his chosen dozen so few and fit are licensed to do that. That Professor Goddard, with his chair in Clark College and the countenancing of the Smithsonian Institution, does not know the relation of action and reaction, and of the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. To say that would be absurd. Of course, he only seems to lack the knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. Of course, it was the Times' reporter who had a flawed understanding of physics, not Goddard, who was a physics professor. In fact, Goddard had realized this would be possible while still in high school when he read Newton's Principia Mathematica and saw that Newton's third law would allow something in the vacuum of space to be navigable. The editor's statement somewhat references this law, but he fails to realize that the rocket ejecting its fuel at high speeds provides the action and reaction needed to provide thrust in a vacuum. Goddard's response to this criticism was initially not scientific at all, simply saying, Every vision is a joke until the first man accomplishes it. Once realized, it becomes commonplace. 
1924, he had a more scientific response. He published a paper in Popular Science Monthly where he outlined an experiment he had just done proving conclusively, for those who still doubted, that a rocket would work in a vacuum. In fact, in this experiment, he showed that the rocket would actually work better in a vacuum. Specifically, he ran 50 tests of a rocket in a chamber that had one 1,500th normal atmospheric pressure. Not only did the rocket still provide thrust in this environment, but it actually provided 20% more thrust than the same setup and test done with normal atmospheric pressure. Despite this conclusive proof, he still was often criticized on this point by the media. It wasn't until the day after the launch of Apollo 11, while it was on its way to the moon, that the New York Times published a retraction on their statements in 1920, which read, Further investigation and experimentation have confirmed the findings of Isaac Newton in the 17th century, and it is now definitely established that a rocket can function in a vacuum as well as in an atmosphere. The Times regrets the error. Of course, Goddard was long dead at this point, having died of cancer on August 10, 1945, at 62 years old. Just 12 years later, on August 4, 1957, the Soviet Union would successfully use a liquid-fueled rocket to launch a man-made object into orbit, Sputnik 1, Satellite 1. On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human to be launched into space. A scant eight years later, Neil Armstrong and Edward Aldrin Jr. walked on the moon. Had he still been alive, Goddard would have been 78 years old when his dream he was so mocked for was finally achieved. And just before we get into the bonus facts today, I'd like to close the main section by reading an excerpt from Goddard's high school valedictorian speech he titled, On Taking Things for Granted. Just as in the sciences, we have learned that we are too ignorant safely to pronounce anything impossible. So for the individual, since we cannot know just what are his limitations, we can hardly say with certainty that anything is necessarily within or beyond his grasp. Each must remember that no one can predict to what heights of wealth, fame, or usefulness he may rise until he has honestly endeavored. And he should derive courage from the fact that all sciences have been, at some time, in the same condition as he, and that it has often proved true that the dream of yesterday is the hope of today and the reality of tomorrow. And now for some bonus facts. In 1951, NASA and the United States Army had to pay $1 million, about $10 million today, to Goddard's widow for violating Goddard's patents in their own rocket designs. This was, at the time, the largest patent settlement the government had ever had to pay out. Further, this was far more money than Goddard himself was ever given to do his rocket research. Goddard not only was a pioneer of liquid-fueled rockets, but he also was the first to experiment with ion thrusters all the way back in 1916 and 1917. He wasn't looking to use these thrusters to propel a rocket into space, but rather use them to propel something once it was already in space. Even though he didn't experiment with this until 1916, he actually thought of it just two years out of high school, mentioning it in a journal entry in September of 1906. Goddard had numerous health problems throughout his life, starting when he was young. As a boy, he constantly had to deal with stomach problems, which resulted in him remaining very thin and frail, and is why it took him to the age of 21 to graduate from high school. He also suffered a variety of of bouts with bronchitis and various colds. All of this caused him to end up being two years behind other students at his high school. However, with all of this time sick in bed, he soon became an autodidact, frequently checking out various physical science books from the library and studying them voraciously. As an adult, he continued to be prone to sickness, most severely after receiving his PhD and taking up a position at Princeton. There, he contracted tuberculosis and was forced to leave Princeton and return home to recover. And now for another bonus fact. During World War I, Goddard began working on a bazooka-like device to be used by the military. He even developed a prototype of this light infantry recall-free weapon and demonstrated it to the US Army. However, the war ended five days after the demonstration, so his invention was not used at this time. In World War II, the military did begin using using rocket-propelled grenades very similar to the designs Goddard had come up with over two decades before. This isn't surprising, as the bazooka was developed by one of Goddard's colleagues at Clark University, Dr. C. N. Hickman, who had also worked with Goddard on the World War I prototype. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. For more from me, why not check out another channel I do called Biographics. If you enjoyed this story of a person, I think you'll enjoy that biography-themed channel longer form explorations into people's lives, it's linked to below. And as always, thank you for watching.